Everyone can be cho, please. Please, can cho. Pour on a pint. Do we love it? This filming audio. Hopefully it is. Hello everyone, my name is Jalen and today I'm here to talk to you about every book that I read in September. Lots of heat in this deck, I must say, so stay tuned. As always, I go in order of when I read them. So to start off the month, what was the tea? What was the tea? Okay, so the first book I read was a poetry collection called What to Miss When. Pause, I have a beer to share with you. Um, it's been a while since I shared a beer on here, actually. This one's called Schwimbad. It's a Dunkelweizen. Here we go. From my fave, Renhouse Brewing. It, you know, I don't really know what it is, <laughs> but I know it, it tastes good. It's like a multi darker beer. It's lower in alcohol content. I think it's like 4.6% but she slaps, so it's my last one actually. Mm. So good, perfect for like October vibes. I know I'm a little late filming this video, but is what it is. All right, so as I was saying, What to Miss When, a poetry collection that's basically a collection of COVID poems. I know that this author, she wrote Self Care, which is on my TBR, I own a copy. Have not read anything by her before. And I will say, I left this one feeling conflicted, kind of meh, haven't really thought about it at all since I finished it. Um, I do think some of the poems were quite funny from what I remember, but some of them were a little bit too vague or a little bit too broadly written in themes, kind of like more philosophical poetry. I felt like there was some kind of distance there for me as a reader. So I don't think these are bad poems per se, I just didn't really connect with them. And I think I have a hard time still, I found reading things that are COVID related. Another book in this stack, is rooted in COVID, but it's more of like a literary thriller and I didn't love it as well. So I don't know if it's like maybe like too soon vibes, but that's not really like me. I wouldn't really say that I'm kind of wary of reading it because I'm, I feel too, like I'm not ready for it, but maybe like subconsciously I am, who knows? But I didn't love it. But if you do want like a quick COVID poetry collection, I would check it out. I just looking at my review that I wrote down. Yeah, the poems often felt muddled, almost too abstract and addressing an issue that is so present for all. I think that is very true. Next up, I have a book that I, adored and kind of controversial in terms of a friend of mine did not like this book. It is, let me grab it. It is Wayward by Dana Spiota. So if you watch Rebecca Eats Books, I know she did not like this book. I was really excited for it because my local bookstore has a book club that picked this as their monthly pick. The head of that, she has really good taste I find. And so I was like, huh, I had an arc of this already. It sounded really good. It has a George Saunders blurb somewhere on here. And I loved his book this year. So I was like, you know what? I'm gonna give this a try. I know she teaches also at Syracuse University. I tend to like books written by professors of creative writing. I feel like they usually try to do something that's kind of like a flex, you know, whether in structure, in prose. I don't know, I tend to have a good time with them. So I read it and I adored it. So this book, it really worked for me because on the one hand, what I love most about this book is its structure. This book is looking at motherhood and we follow a woman who is experiencing menopause or I believe it's called perimenopause, so like pre. I don't know why it's called peri instead of pre. I don't know. She's in her 50s and she one day decides to buy a home that is basically a fixer upper and she wants to leave her husband and she has a teenage daughter as well. And so she wake, she realizes this after she purchases the house. She like isn't really intentionally thinking about it. She's just like buys the house and she's like, wait, what am I like, I think I need to leave my husband kind of. And so you go through the book and you realize why she's making this decision. And then you also get from the perspective of her daughter as you go through it. So the mother's name is Sam and the daughter's name is Allie. And there's this really interesting kind of back and forth structure here that I really, really enjoyed. And I will say this book is deeply rooted in architecture, which I did not really think I would enjoy per se. Like on paper, I wouldn't think I would wanna read a book about like homes or home buying or architecture, but I really love the way that she does it and kind of frames this narrative about motherhood and about change through the lens of purchasing a home or just making a different big step in your life. And one of those can be buying a home. And I loved the writing here. I loved the characters and just thinking through these kind of big decisions that this character is making in her life and getting to the root of why she's doing it, while also looking at the ways that she's affecting her child and how that's impacting her and whether a mother in her autonomy can or should or should not make decisions that sacrifice the happiness or maybe well-being of her daughter. And I think this book explores that question really, really well, but more broadly, why I think I connected to it was just 
thinking about a sense of change and the ways in which humans kind of grapple with those and are afraid of change and when we actually take the plunge like what does that mean for a person and can it go well what are the difficulties in doing that i think this book does that all so well and coming away from this book i was just in awe of the structure and i i don't know i think that's like the key takeaway here is this kind of play with architecture and st the structure of the novel that kind of bounces back and forth and it's kind of playful in that regard while also thinking about homes and what it means to belong somewhere and thinking about parenthood motherhood finding personal happiness in the cost of, of finding that. I think this book explores all that beautifully. I never really thought I would like love a book about you know menopause and divorce, and it just doesn't really, I don't know. Going into it, I was kind of skeptical, but I, I loved it, so. And what I think is so smart about this book is that it really, the main character, Sam, she really takes herself to task with and it asks readers, namely, you know, women, white women in their 50s, what it, what they are doing now in the current, you know, political climate. This is post-Trump. I think it's like right after the inauguration. So it's also quite a political novel and looking at what it means to be a woman in her 50s and being white and like having the autonomy to make these changes while others do not and really grappling with those questions as well. And I really think it does take readers to task on those, on those questions. And so I just really feel like this book is quite human in terms of really grappling with how to find your place in life, given your particular circumstances. And I think it does that while thinking about these things in a current framework, while also kind of making it feel such like a novel because it feels so timeless as well. And these kind of broader questions of motherhood and being selfish versus not, I don't know. I loved it. I could talk about this book endlessly, but I couldn't put it down after I picked it up. I really, really enjoyed it. Oh, I hate when I stack these opposite. Okay, next I read a slim little book called Simple Passion by Annie Ernaux. So this book I think is like 40 pages. It's like an essay, in a sense, about a woman, in short, who is infatuated with a man who is married and longing for him. And so I found this here. I've been reading a lot of these books about a woman who is depressed and longing for a man that she can't have, or like in an abusive relationship, a toxic relationship, and and this one I think is kind of like the blueprint in a way. I think this one was written in like the 80s or 90s. Um, so it was interesting reading this like after reading some other ones. I'll name them here, Acts of Des Desperation and Magma. Those are two that come to mind immediately. This book is just like, the takeaway for me was the writing here and just thinking about how she thinks about her personhood in light of this relationship from kind of like a distance to it and the ways that it completely consumed her and the ways that looks for a person, even from like the outside when you think it might be unreasonable for her to be so tied to this married man, she really explains the depths of her longing. And you know me, I'm a lad who loves books about longing. And so this one really fell right into it. And it's very like spare prose that I loved. It has a fragmentary structure too. And just a lot of, basically a collection of thoughts on her experience in this relationship. I believe this is autofiction or like memoir, but I thought the writing was beautiful. I wanna read more from her, excellent stuff. All right, next I have nonfiction for you. Cultish, The Language of Fanaticism by Amanda Montel. So, adored this book as well. Lots of heat, I'm telling you. So this book basically looks at language and cults and the ways that us as everyday people, I mean, I guess I should, let me back up for a second. She basically uses her thesis to say, like, many of us believe that we would not be persuaded to join a cult. And she completely breaks that open and makes you realize how many cults you're currently in and analyzing the ways that they use certain language and what she calls thought terminating cliches to really get people indoctrinated in cults and how to identify them in everyday life and just not even condemning every cult. She does look at some of the more violent and horrific cults, but she also looks at some that seem kind of more commonplace, i.e. Bookstagram, Booktube. She looks at all of these things and considers, or asks the reader to consider what is a cult, what is not a cult. Identify when you're being complicit in it and whether you actually want to be to make more informed decisions in moving about your everyday life under capitalism. There's a lot of ideas in this book. I do think my one tiny complaint, I'll give us like 4.5 stars, I guess. I do think from a writing perspective, she does a lot of this thing in here where she says like, we'll learn more about that in part 5A or like like tune in for like part 6B to learn more about these certain like fitness brands or something. And I, I was just like, just just write the book and I just wanna read it. I don't need you to tell me what's coming up in the book. Like I get it, I can look at the table of contents. Like I didn't like that part, but it's a very like minor thing that kind of drove me nuts in this book, but otherwise brilliant. I think there's so many excellent ideas in here about how cults work and like a bunch of different identified stories of people that were involved in them. She interviews a bunch of people and considers how they got involved in them. 
I do think like one thing that I find is interesting is how a lot of people like on Bookstagram, Booktube, just like in book influencing always say like they enjoy, or even like on Goodreads, I see people say like, I love books about cults. And it's like, I wonder why that is. And this book really answers that. I think it's because there's this natural inclination to wonder how people can kind of fall into the depths of a cult. And this answers that very well. And a different approach to like analyzing cult, it wasn't just like thinking about cults generally, it really goes to the language in cults and cult leaders and how they use and manipulate people through that and persuade them into joining cults. Very, very fun to read. Very interesting. And there's a lot of grim stuff going on in this book too. There's a lot of descriptions of like when cults are terrible, but I liked it a lot. Do I even want to talk about this book yet? I'm going to save the best for last, all right? Keep watching for one of the best books I've ever read in my life. Um, so next up, a book I was kind of disappointed by, or I wasn't kind of, I was disappointed by. It is Deborah Levy's Things I Don't Want to Know. So before people come for me, <laughs> I know she is a booktube darling from what I've seen, especially like in a lot of the booktubers that read a lot of literary fiction, memoir, like they love Deborah Levy. So this is the first in an autobiographical trilogy of hers. And you know me, I am a book buying lad. And so since I saw so much praise for her work, I ended up buying the whole trilogy before reading any of them because I liked the covers in the UK. Drag me if you want to. So this book is rooted in two things I found. One being her childhood and two being why she or how she fell into writing and really analyzing why she writes as an introduction to her memoir trilogy. That's like all I can really say about it. It didn't do much for me. It was a lot of, it just felt like kind of a mess. I feel like she's purely thinking on the page, but it wasn't like an edit afterwards to really like figure out, okay, what do I need to say in the introduction to my memoir, if that makes sense. You know, she really looks at the trauma of her past and her father being jailed. She thinks about how she grew up and how that impacted her and the ways that her peers treated her growing up and thinking through all these questions in light of, I guess, George Orwell's famous essay called Why I Write. So it's kind of like an interesting thought experiment, I guess, to really think through the burgeoning childhood and how she became a writer through that lens. I just felt like it was kind of all over the place and didn't really come together for me. It didn't feel focused. But I can tell, like, there's inklings here that I can tell that she's a good writer, of course, and so many people love her, and I'm gonna try another one of hers. But I'm not obsessed so far. And I'm sad because I really want it to be. But it was very quick, and I do, I will say, I do think one thing that kind of was a bad choice on my part was I started this book on a plane, and I read like half of it, but okay, again, it wasn't really like calling to me a lot, but I was like, it's short, I'm flying through it. And then I took a little bit of a break, like one or two weeks, and then I picked it up again and read the second half, and I was kind of like, disoriented that way. And this book is so short that I think it would be best to read this in one sitting. So maybe that's some of my like lack of cohesion here was m my fault because I didn't read it all in one sitting, but drag me in the comments if I'm wrong about Deborah Levy. <laughs> Next is another disappointment. And then, then I think we're good from there. So the other COVID book that I read that I was quite just like eh on was The Guide by Peter Heller. So I know this author has a bunch of books and this one is a sequel to a book called The River. I haven't read The River. I think I have it on a Kindle from like four years ago or something when I bought it because it sounded pretty good. Literary thriller. I like those. I tend to. And so this one is a sequel, but you don't need to read the, the River to have read this book. Long and short of it, it follows this guy named Jack who is going to this like fishing camp lodge for a bunch of like very famous people that go there. This book is COVID related because it is set three years after a global pandemic, basically coronavirus. So it's a bit dystopian looking at what this could look like years from now in the ways that rich people will behave in light of the pandemic. And so he goes to this fishing, what is the word, like camp lodge, and he's gonna be a guide there. So he's gonna like take rich people out and go fishing. And he gets to stay there and he quickly sees like there's cameras set up around and he doesn't like that he's being watched. So something weird's going on and then he gets involved with the woman that he is guiding through fishing. Her name is Allison Kay, I believe, who's Alison Krauss, I guess she's a country singer, I don't listen to country, but she's based on a real person. And then they have a romance that ensues and you learn more about what's going on at this fishing camp. And then it becomes like an action film by the end of it. But I do think the one thing that did work for me in this book was there's a lot of quite beautiful nature writing and reflections on grief. You learn more about Jack's past and why he is particularly motivated to figure out what's going on here. But I do think by the end of it, I was just like, I was dying for it to end. It just felt too thriller-y for me, too plotty. And then again, like I liked the nature writing aspects, but I was so just wanting to get, get it over with that I wasn't even like really enjoying that part of it. It felt like kind of this weird mismatch of like poetic language with like guns blazing thriller by the end of it. And I was just like, 
I don't know. This isn't for me. I read it from my book club, my local book club. So this one, I know I said earlier that I usually like the picks there, but this one didn't love. But talking about it actually made me like it a little bit more. Book clubs really help salvage some books that I do not like. Okay, briefly touching on one more nonfiction book. I talked about this in my last video, or my last wrap up. I was reading this for like three months. I listened to the audiobook. It's a fat, fat book, nonfiction, not my usual thing, but it's all about the Sackler family and the opioid crisis and really looking at the family. I listened to the last two hours and I just want to say, what the fuck? Like, mind boggling, the delusion, the denial, the greed, the f total fucked upness of this family was wild to read and it really comes together more by the end of it. Like you get, you see it throughout the entire book, but it really, like when you see the kind of more macro effects of the op opioid crisis and what they knew and what they like were in denial about was just like, what the hell? And like all the litigation that has ensued, it goes up until the present moment. And so, I don't know, I just wanna say one more time, if you like investigative journalism, if you like nonfiction, I think it's a must read. It was fascinating to read, so I loved it. And it's great on audio. Okay, we have two more, no three more. I'm saving the baddie for last, which I don't even know how I'm gonna talk about it. All right, not to foreshadow too much. Oh, so the next two are horror novels, or books, I should say. I have My Heart is a Chainsaw by Stephen Graham Jones. So, I DNF'd his previous book that he published, I think, last year. It was called The Only Good Indians, for the following reason. I was really interested in the premise. It has, like, a supernatural slasher vibe in the other one. I don't even remember what it's about, really, so I apologize. But... I will say the writing was so, the prose was so confusing. Like I did not, I couldn't like understand what was going on. His descriptions were like quite weird and abstract and almost he writes it like in a kind of colloquial way, I would say, where he doesn't, like he just kind of goes for it. And he's like, if you, if you don't understand, like sucks to suck, I guess. Like it was, it's a weird experience reading. And this book has some of that going on, but much less, I would say. The Only Good Indians, I was like, wait, there's so many characters kind of like name soupy. I was like, wait, what are, what are we describing? Like supernatural things were happening. And I was like, wait, what? Like, I, I just was not vibing with the prose. Anyways, if you can tell I didn't like it, that's why, from what I can remember. But if you know me, I love a slasher, particularly meta slashers. My favorite movie of all time is Scream. Also, a new one that's coming out in January. I'm very, very excited. And so I saw a lot of people love The Only Good Indian. I was like, am I missing something? I don't know. And he seems to be a quite, like, up-and-coming... He's had a lot of books published, but I mean, he seems like a new, like the next big thing in horror. Um, so I want to try another one. And I figured if I'm going to try one more, I want to do a slasher. And this one just came out. got it from my library the day it was released, which is cool. So we follow a teenager who's 17. Her name is Jade Daniels, who is Native American, and she lives in Proof Rock, Idaho. And she immediately, you get the sense that she is an outsider. She is obsessed with slasher films, and she begins to think that something's going on in this town after bodies show up in the lake. And so immediately I'm like, ooh okay, I love like a meta slasher with a character that knows a lot about slashers. So recently I read The Final Girl Support Group by Grady Hendrix and that book had none of the nuance or meta-ness that I expected it to have given how much Grady Hendrix knows about horror and about the slasher genre. And so I was like, maybe this is gonna give like the analysis of slashers that I wanted and it did. So I loved all those aspects of it. So it's broken up in a bunch of chapters, but then in between the chapters, it is told in these uh, slasher 101s that Jade is writing to her history teacher about the history of the slasher and what she knows about it for extra credit as she is not the best student. So I love that. So it kind of like plays into what's going on in the main narrative. Loved all of that. But I will say some of the problems persisted from The Only Good Indians here. I think this book is quite bloated. I do think some of the descriptions were very confusing, but most of them weren't. So I could, it was readable. Like it wasn't, like, I, I got the gist of what was going on, but sometimes when it got plotty, I was like, wait. Like, I had to, like, pause and, like, think. It's hard for me to explain why it was confusing. It was just, like, it wasn't a clear, it's not clearly told, I, I would say. I don't know, slashery elements going on here. It was just like, wait, what is going on? So, like, initially, I had a theory about this book that was actually wrong. So that was, like, fun to see, but I was also, like, very disoriented by the end of the book. I don't know, it was mixed. I, so let me just conclude here. I will say, I would read this book if you like slashers, if you like horror, if you like his books, definitely read it, um, cause I like this one. I just will say some of the paciness and quite bloatiness of this book didn't work for me and it was kind of confusing, but it was fun. And I really like this character. I really think this book got to me when you learn more about Jade's past and how that all plays out throughout the rest of the book. I thought it was so well done, so heartbreaking. And she's a great character. I will say I really was like rooting for her as you should for you know the main character in a slasher. She doesn't think she's a final girl, but 
as a reader, you know, like you're following her perspective. So of course she's going to be the focus here. And I loved her as a character, a lot about colonization in this setting. And I thought that was really well done as well. So loved all that, had some problems, but it was fun. I couldn't put it down either. So that was a very mixed review, but I will say I recommend it if you like the things that I said. All right, two more. Last one is a book I loved. It is The Strange Thing We Become in Other Dark Tales by Eric LaRocca. It is a collection of nine stories. And what I love about this is it's kind of this, the back says it, it's literary dark fiction. So it wasn't, no, I take it back. I was gonna say it doesn't read as like pure horror, but yes it does, like what am I talking about? Um, I, but I will say there's a lot of literary elements here and a very clear thematic tie throughout all these stories, which I love in a collection. I love when the stories are focused, not just in like vibe, but in theme. I really like that. And this one is deeply, deeply rooted in grief and loss and family, I would say. All these stories kind of play into that, but they all do very different things, I will say. And I loved that kind of flex on his part of like looking at kind of more like is mundane the right word? I don't know, maybe like interpersonal stories versus some that were kind of more like thriller-ish, like action focused, where a lot of like plotty things were going on. They're all quite plotty in a sense, but they all have that propulsion that I like in short stories. There's a lot going on in all of them. And every time I picked one up, I couldn't put it down until I finished it, which I think is necessary for a short story. And he knows what he's doing in that front. Very like well-crafted stories. I would say trigger warnings going into this one. There's some stories that are wild, bananas. And one of the stories in particular is about a woman who she has intrusive thoughts about burning things and how that plays out with a child. Like whether like she's trying to refrain from hurting this child and it was just like, what the fuck am I reading? Like it was like, I was shook. There's a lot of similar themes. If you have read his other book called Things Have Gotten Worse Since You Last Spoke, there's a story that's quite similar in tone about a queer couple. One of them gets a cancer diagnosis and the ways that the grief plays out and Oh my God, like these, these stories are wild and they're so good and they're so vivid in my mind. And that's why I loved it. It's just excellent. I think he's so good. I love finding, this is so cool because he's like an indie, really truly up and coming horror writer. Stephen Grand Jones is, um, he's already with a big publisher and I know Eric LaRocca is still with indie presses and he's still kind of, he just blew up from his last book. And so I just am really rooting for him as a queer horror writer. I think he's so good. I'm very excited to read more from him. He has this very like poetic, but very like propulsive writing style that I just adore. I think he's so good, so talented. I'm hoping he'll come on the pod, actually. I think that'd be very fun to talk to him about all this because he he's right in that sweet spot for me of like horror, but also kind of blending some more. He is really like emotional horror while really not, like he will, he'll go there if he wants to. He does not care about messing you up at all. He does not, he does not care about your feelings. He just wants to hurt your feelings <laughs> for sure. Last book, and I will say, I'm being so dramatic, but it's kind of fun. I am going to read this book again. So anything I say here is just like me being like unspecific and just like raving, but I'm hoping that's enough for you to want to read this book because I want everyone to read it and I want to see what people think about it. I'm gonna read it again. I'm gonna do a separate video review about why I love this book so much because I was just like shook while reading this book. It just did so many things. Like it was just, okay, anyways, the book is Pure Color by Sheila Hetty which is out February 15th, 2022. This is such a strange, philosophical, unique, original novel. As soon as you read the first page, you realize you're in for something interesting to say the least. I'm just gonna read you the introduction to this, all right? It's quite short, so bear with me. This is the first page. After God created the heavens and the earth, he stood back to contemplate creation, like a painter standing back from the canvas. This is the moment we are living in, the moment of God standing back. Who knows how long it has been going on for? Since the beginning of time, no doubt. But how long is that? And for how much longer will it continue? You'd think it would only last a moment, this delay of God standing back before stepping forward again to finish the canvas. But it appears to be going on forever. But who knows how long or short this world of ours seems from the vanishing point of eternity. When I read that, I was like, okay, let me buckle up, let me tighten the strap, like, let's go. You know what I mean? Like, I was ready and I was like, wait, what is, is this a novel? Or is this like, like, what is, like, what is this gonna be? And it's a novel, I will say it's a novel. It is strange. This book just like, woo, it was like the writing, the writing. So I, so I had a copy of this on my Kindle, right? And CJ gave me this physical copy. She got two, gave me one cause she knows I'm obsessed. I haven't shut up in the group chat about it. But I highlighted this book to death. I've never highlighted a book more. I would get to like pages and I would just like highlight the whole thing. And I'm like, this is not even beneficial. Like the book just slaps, you know what I mean? Like it deserves to be read and reread. Sheila Hetty's kind of pondering 
the meaning of life, right? A lot of novels do this, but she does it in such a cool way. She gives you like a philosophical framework. She, she has this framework of like three types of people, right? She calls them a fish, a bird, and a bear. And she looks at these different characters in this book who kind of fit into these different personalities. And you see the ways that this main character, Mira, she's grappling with the loss of her father and a love for another woman. And so this is a queer book, we love that rooted in grief and aside from that really looking at philosophy and the meaning of life and the purpose and grappling with your humanity despite much of its bleakness which is something that I love in fiction and this book does it so perfectly it is so weird it is so out there it, it challenges you as a reader because you're like what is going on like in one part the example I give when I have been talking about this book to people is there's one part in which after the main character's father dies she enters into a leaf a leaf like on a tree in which her father's spirit resides and she's in there with him and in the text every other sentence becomes this back and forth conversation with her father but it becomes like one conscience conscience and so it's disorienting but cool and it's just like I love books that flex and Sheila Hetty's flexing in this book and I love it what the crux of this novel is about is when Mira decides to enter the world again after sitting with her father she thinks about like what what does she want to do? Should she enter the world again? What is coming next? And then her love for this woman. And so the novelistic aspects of this that keep it kind of traditional is this look at romance, this look at grief, and it has characters, there's things that happen and it all ties beautifully by the end, trust me. But I love the more philosophical, experimental aspects of this book that just made me so excited. So anyways, I'm just gonna leave it there. I'm gonna read this again. I'm gonna try to kind of maybe pull some more coherent thoughts. I just, wow. Like one of the best books I've ever read and it's just so exciting. I haven't had this feeling in a long time where a book is just like, yes, 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 yes. And this is it. So it comes out February. I know it's a bit of a ways to wait, but just, I am obsessed. Not to gas it up too much as I just did, but anyways, I've been raving for like almost 10 minutes about this book. So this was my standout and one of the best books I've ever read, one of the best books of the year so far for me, like, banger, and this cover, Jesus. You didn't have to go so hard, sis, pop off, wig. Like, yeah, that's that book. Anyways, that was September. Um, I hope you enjoyed. That was actually a fun wrap up for me to film. I feel like I'm in good spirits right now. Um, sometimes I'm like, how am I gonna talk about these books today? Like, how am I gonna string together thoughts? But I will catch you in the next one. Ooh, cheers.